It's day five. You see me smiling. On the one hand, I'm extremely excited about the day today, but I'm also excited that after a long week, uh, there might be a little bit more time for life balance. I don't know what's about you. Um, it was a long week and I just want to recap shortly so that later on in the recordings on our OPC Foundation YouTube channel, you also find the other sessions of the week. So we started on day one early this week with our keynotes about energy transformation. We had OPC in fantastic projects like the carbon capture and storage project in uh, the North. We had it in building automation where OPC was selected instead of other uh, established protocols because of modeling security. On day two, we had the OPC UA day about the core technology. We learned about security, um, what is important, obviously, to switch it on. Don't forget it. But also that it's confirmed by external experts that it is uh, secured and there is no uh, issue with it. Uh, we learned about OPC UA from edge to cloud and the extensions and uh, mapping of OPC UA over MQTT. And we learned from Peter Lutz updates on OPC UA in the field level, extending it with deterministic functional safety on motion. On day three, we had our collaboration day. The OPC Foundation is collaborating with over 60 partners worldwide. They are the domain experts. They define the semantic and together with OPCUA, we have semantic secured industrial interoperability. We not only gave an update on existing topics, we also announced new groups like the Kaizi group, which is closely aligned with the LUTS group and all is about laboratory equipment also being connected to the cloud. Um, that was fantastic. And we did something with um, global positioning, which we also will announce as a new uh, working group and the uh, uh, invitation will be sent out soon. But also obviously harmonization was a key on the th day three, so you shouldn't miss that, obviously. On day four yesterday, we had a fantastic speech from our CTO of the OPC Foundation, Jim Luce. Um, talking about how, how can I establish multiple OPC components, not only one, one client talking to one server, that's easy obviously, but if you have it dozens, hundreds, thousand devices, how do you organize them, how do you d uh, deploy certificates and make it happen? Um, Erich Banschett, he initiated the OPC UA for cloud library together with Jonathan from Inray, he also showed adoption, real adoption of it. Uh, all this work has been released already last year, but Erich also categorized how does everything fit together in the big picture. OPC, MQTT, the asset administration shell. That was a perfect speech. And then we had two end users with remarkable presentations on the world largest solar panel and the world largest offshore wind turbine. Um, uh, farms, all of them are using OPC UA. And Mariatu from L'Oreal also talked about OPC UA in their factories to increase the operational performances. Today, on day five, we will have a mixed set of information um, where we show exactly where we give answers on a lot of open topics and all these topics have been addressed with easy solutions by our representatives from toolkit vendors and the toolkit vendors will introduce themselves anyway they are also live available for the Q&A part but remember that they have deepest knowledge they help you with their offerings, commercial offerings, to have a REM start. And obviously, they always get the frequently asked questions from their clients. How can I do this? How can I do that? What is the difference here? I heard rumor 
that the efficiency on OPC UA on the wire is not good because the message is too big or whatever. And then they have great answers to better explain it. I'm not going down and read all the topics here uh, line by line because you can read on your own. Um, but we will see that everybody is addressing it, the, the first the challenge and then the solution coming up with OPCA. So before we start, I'm answering the question which we get every day, every morning, and we answer it every day and every morning and every evening. It is, are the presentations available later on? And the answer is yes. Uh, we are publishing the recordings of the day, plus we are publishing the presentations of the day. You as an attendee, because you subscribed to this event, will receive an email once everything is published and ready, and then you can download it. The email will include the link where to find the material. Obviously, it's the OPC Foundation YouTube channel, and on the OPC web, you can also download the presentations. The Q&A part is not being published as a recording, but we are collecting all the questions, distributing them also to all the speakers again. They can categorize a little bit because sometimes questions are overlapping. They will answer it, then we collect it again, then we deploy it. This will take a little bit more time, but you will get another email with that download link also. With this short introduction, I'm handing over to the speakers and um, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, this is Derek from Matricon and in this session I'll talk about migrating towards a unified solution for your data connectivity. So when we look at the big picture uh, across the marketplace, there are many forces at play for that are affecting how companies compete. So whether that's globalization or changes in the workforce, whether you have to work remote or people are retiring or new people are coming in, uh, supply chain challenges, uh, environmental uh, issues, all sorts of things are affecting how businesses run. And one viable way to start to compete in this environment or even to start to dominate if you do it right is through digitalization. So if you have automation in your business and you have a way to tie that to the rest of the enterprise, you of course start to make better decisions faster because they're based on the data that's coming directly from your plants or your shops. And therefore you have a clearer view of what's happening internally in the company and also you can respond faster to, to the marketplace. So there are a number of uh, data, let's say, uh, technology enablers that are actually making this happen. So whether we're talking about, of course, having automation in the company or the adoption of open standards to lower the barriers between, uh, you know, vendor lock-in or proprietary systems. There's also the Internet of Things, so a more global perspective of how you actually share that data and what you can do with it. And hand in hand with that come the types of analytics that you can do. So whether you've got AI or machine learning uh, or just all sorts of other big data type activities. But to bring all this together, uh, one thing that is very clear is that of course you need proper access not only to the data, it has to be secure access, and you need to get it in a context um, that's actually useful for those who are going to use it at whatever level they're at in the company. So OPC UA is a standard that actually does that. It provides that capability. And I just cover some of the aspects of why it stands out as a key uh, data connectivity standard for you know, the current IoT era. So when we look at a, <clears throat> a company, there are various factors that we have to take into account to say that we've got a complete solution for our data connectivity or the use of data across the enterprise. So when you look at the different company levels at each one of these, whether you're talking about things happening on the shop floor or just overall in operations, and then you shift over into the business network or even out to the cloud, you actually have common requirements, although they might come in different forms. So for data access, as far as the ability to talk to data sources or to talk across the network to access the information that came from those sources, that's a must across the enterprise. 
You also need end-to-end -end security. So whichever A to B point that you're dealing with or spanning the entire uh, corporation, you still have to make sure that that data is secure, especially with the growing threats uh, of what happens when you're using digital communications. Uh, and top of that, you also have to adjust for or take into account what uh, transport you're going to use. Uh, because the types of information and how quickly you need to share that information down on the shop floor is not the same as the environments that you deal with across the enterprise or when you're talking to, you know, to clouds or cloud communications. So when you want to put together a solution that encompasses everything, call it the, basically a unified uh, way of, of communicating, uh, this is the challenge. Right. And now, even if you have all that, you still have to address the, the fact that you need to have it in a context that can actually be used by the recipients that are going to use this information and hence how you express the data and um, whether you're able to provide multiple views and how easily new components that get added in can start to use that information. All of that falls into the, let's say, the catch all category that I have here for kind of a standardized context how you share it and, and how you work with it. Now, the good news is, is that OPC UA actually does all of this. Uh, additional good news is that you don't have to use every feature and facet that OPC UA provides. You just need to use the, the pieces of that technology that are relevant to whatever your company is using. So that gives you room to grow and at the same time doesn't overcomplicate how you implement your solution today versus what you'll do when you do grow. OK, now one way to look at this uh, overall, this unified solution and what, is, what does that look like where you either cobble together multiple standards to try to make it work uh, or you use sort of a common unified method. So uh, if you think about it as a balancing act for trying to get these different systems to work together, when you start to scale up, it's not just one person trying to figure out how to make particular functions work. You're actually adding more and more people, more departments, more systems that are trying to work with the data. They get further and further away from the data sources and you're trying to keep all this running. So it basically starts looking like sort of a giant, uh, you know, circus act where you're trying to balance all sorts of things, many people, many moving parts, and that starts to get complicated. And this is where sustainability starts to be A, expensive and B, a little bit unstable. Now, the alternative to that is when we are talking about a scaled or scalable unified solution is, for example, using OPC UA, which means that you're actually doing more of the same thing. So you're actually just using different components of the same standard, but the standard is broad enough in order to support the entire, uh, the entire operation. And that's basically what happens here. So when you use OPC UA, you get a sustainable solution because everything is unified and it actually works the same way. So to sum it up, um, why do you need a unified solution? Because it ties together various uh, aspects that are all essential for actually making the data sharing meaningful, secure, and uh, sustainable across the enterprise so that you can pursue digitalization and competing better in the marketplace uh, using something that's, that's proven and adopted basically around the world. So even as you do add additional components, the odds of them working easily with the rest of the systems that you already have in place is uh, much higher. OK, so anyways, that's hope you enjoyed it. That's the, the quick overview of how when you're using OPC UA, you actually are going towards a unified solution that provides you enterprise wide data access um, in a context that everybody can can use. All right, so see you next time. Hello everyone, Derek here from Matricon. In this session, I'll be talking about brownfield modernization and using gateways or aggregators in order to, to help facilitate that. So let's set this up. 
first of all, you have basically two scenarios. You either have a brownfield situation where you've got existing infrastructure in place already, and that may have been installed many years ago, 20, 30 or more years ago. Uh, so some of the data that's generated from those systems might uh, not have much protection at all, not much security. Uh, the context uh, might be questionable. Maybe you've got a lot of Modbus devices just serving you data and register values and without much co more context than that. Uh, you also have proprietary systems and um, you've also invested a lot of money into it over the years and you're trying to maximize the value you get from that. On the other hand, you might have uh, new uh, installations where basically you're putting in some of the latest and greatest equipment. Uh, if you've got much better security built in, uh, there's much more awareness or adherence to open standards. Uh, the contextual information is, is richer, but of course it comes at a cost. So if you're building a new site, that's okay. And uh, it's of course, uh, you're going to use the, the best technology that you can given today. Um, however, if you've got an existing site now the question is well how do you move that whole thing forward so of course a blended approach uh, works the best in this case uh, so it's kind of a phased migration where you're not uh, you know ripping out uh, all the old stuff and putting in brand new things because that's not only economically not feasible but also it's a huge change uh, to to bring about in the operations of the company and also even training people up to to get that all running so the question is, well, how do you move the company forward as a whole? Uh, how do you pre preserve those uh, existing investments uh, while minimizing the costs for bringing in new systems? And uh, the way to do that with OPC UA uh, in one part is to use OPC UA gateways, which serve a number of functions. So a gateway generally is a, well, it is a generic term, uh, but it does certain things uh, regardless of which vendor you get it from. The, There'll be variations in what functionality is actually included, but overall you get uh, you'll get a common kind of idea of what the gateway will do. So number one, to address the the fact that you might have older systems or systems that are still running OPC Classic, which was the dominant open standard way for doing data communications in the past, uh, is the ability to do a conversion, uh, a live conversion between the the classic components and the OPC UA components that they need to talk to. So in this case, if you have an OPC UA gateway, uh, one of the things that you want is a component that would enable either a OPC classic client to talk to it, and therefore you need a translation in order to translate from the classic client to the UA server that the OPC UA gateway is, or you need the OPC UA gateway uh, to be able to communicate with uh, OPC classic server. So even though it's UA based, it then translates and actually talks OPC Classic to the server, but then it maintains its own OPC UA functionality, let's say internally. So some examples of software that does that, uh, Matricon uh, OPC UA Tunneler, it does the conversions. Also Unified Automation has their UA gateway, same thing. They will also facilitate that translation live. So a gateway then would be able to, to communicate with those components while also of course communicating OPC UA. The other side of this is to say, okay, well, once you establish those communications, you also want to be able to uh, group that those sources that are coming into the gateway into a common access point and actually have the, the rest of the enterprise or the rest of the components pulling information from those sources to come to one point, which is why you federated everything and it's at the gateway. So things like Matricon Data Broker or again, uh, Unified Automation's UA Gateway will do that when they federate the, the sources. They do a number of things to, to help a, protect them because you don't need, now need to connect directly to the data sources. So for the older ones, uh, if they don't have sufficient security uh, built into them, well, now you're actually getting people to connect directly to the gateway and it employs OPC UA security. You also don't need to actually load down those data sources because the single connection from the gateway actually facilitates that communication and then all the other clients sitting above it will actually connect to the gateway, not to the data sources. Okay, and by bringing all those together, you basically have one common place, one, one connection that you need to make. And within that address space in the gateway, you can find all the information that you need from the different areas. 
So if you've got older systems that are using OPC Classic servers to facilitate talking to proprietary communications, or they just natively talk OPC Classic, this will convert uh, them to OPC UA. And then once they're all put together, you can of course communicate with OPC UA components or even classic ones if uh, if that's required as well. So that's that's really what a gateway does for you. So it's kind of a winning combination, let's say, where you bring together the OPC UA functionality together uh, to with your existing infrastructure to have sort of a phased migration scenario where the OPC UA gateway facilitates that. So number one, you can start to adopt new components, the, the OPC UA based ones. Uh, without hindering uh, using the, the existing older equipment. And some of the benefits are, again, the data security that comes from that, because in the end, you are getting end-to-end -end security that the gateway provides going up. You get uh, this, you're protecting those data sources because things aren't connecting directly to them. So that reduces the loading on them. And then as well, you increase actually the value of the data or potentially you can because one of the features in gateways, for example, like data broker uh, is the ability to bring in information models and map the data sources information that comes from them to various information models that you read in or companion specifications. And that allows you to express that information in a context that other clients might want to see it in. Right. So if you're pulling in, for example, a companion spec, uh, let's say one of the VDMA specs or an empty connect uh, companion specification, and you want to see that information in that format, uh, this is what would allow you to do it. So it actually enhances the value of the data that's coming because it's enriching the context. OK, so there's a lot that's uh, worth looking at there. Uh, so it's not just a straight connection and just transferring you know, the same old values through OPC UA. You can actually enhance them. And once you have all that in the gateway, then finally, of course, the UA gateways also extend further the functionality because OPC UA can also communicate to cloud. So the UA gateways form kind of a nice jump point where you could use that to actually then send information to the cloud or elsewhere throughout the uh, the enterprise. OK, so that's that's it for um, modernizing Brownfield OPC UA style using uh, gateways and aggregators. So. Uh, Hope you found this useful and talk to you next time. Take care. Hi everyone, this is Joni from Process OPC. In this presentation, I will uh, talk about the ITOT convergence with uh, OPC UA. Let's first look at the uh, traditional industrial application landscape, where we have these uh, different applications that are probably most familiar to you. Uh, we have the ERP systems, uh, enterprise resource planning, and uh, manufacturing execution systems that uh, typically reside in the IT network, where we have uh, the high level of production control. And these are typically connected to the internet, so uh, the security of this network is, is not as, as uh, good as it is on the lower OT network, where we have these uh, low level production control from the SCADA applications and PLCs, ECS systems. And we typically also have the process historians in this uh, scenario. So this network is typically secured from the internet because we don't want to get intruders from the uh, in internet to the, uh, to the production control. And now we have uh, coming up these new uh, requirements that we want to, uh, to use applications in the cloud and deliver data securely from the production to the cloud. And for those purposes, we've seen a uh, group of applications called edge gateways uh, entering the market in the recent times. Security uh, within this architecture is defined by keeping these networks uh, securely separated and uh, to improve 
uh, that, we can uh, have these kind of demilitarized zones in between these networks, and uh, then we can take all the communications through uh, gateway in between to ensure that uh, nothing nothing can intrude the operation network especially. Now, OPC UA communication fits uh, very well with this kind of uh, scenario. We have the traditional client-server communication being established uh, for a long time, and it's uh, especially suitable for process monitoring, uh, production control, and even for the production orchestration, where it's been very popular between the uh, PLC, SCADA, MES systems, and uh, also uh, OPC UA works very well between the ERP and MES systems, although it hasn't been uh, the sweet spot so far. Uh, but we have already a lot of applications uh, taking advantage of OPC UA on that level too. Now we have the new uh, Fox up flavor of OPC UA being introduced, and uh, it has two different application areas. First one is the field level, and, and we have the new OPC UA field exchange uh, specification that is uh, defining more details on, uh, on how it's also combined with, uh, with the safety and motion control requirements, for example, and, and run in a deterministic network. Uh, here we have the pops up UDP flavor that is uh, providing this functionality. But uh, remember, the client server technology is still used in, in FX as well, very much. Uh, on the other hand, we have the uh, pops up MQTT protocol, which is uh, the best suitable uh, for delivering data securely to the cloud systems in a standard way. And uh, then I would uh, like to mention also that uh, MQTT is getting more and more popular in this kind of information level communication, which I call uh, InfoBus in my presentation, and a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes. But uh, if we look at the trends uh, in smart manufacturing, uh, we've basically still very much in this industry 3.0 world with this hierarchical communication and with the client server model that we've been uh, using. But uh, we are moving towards the industry 4.0 architecture where everything is connected to everything, basically. And uh, the publisher subscriber model works much better for, for these purposes. So let me describe this idea of the info bus. Uh, this is the terminology that I've I've just uh, created for this presentation. Uh, I don't really see any existing uh, name for this, but uh, but this could be one uh, one candidate. In the case that everything is connected to everything, we don't really want to configure all these uh, connections between uh, all the components. We're getting more devices uh, to the communication, more machines, more systems, more applications, and overall more and more uh, connections. So the uh, architecture could be defined that we have just a, a common communication bus uh, where everything is, is connecting to. And in practice, this can be ac accomplished uh, with an MQTT broker uh, where all the applications publish their data. And then they can also uh, subscribe to all the data that they find from the other applications that they need. and. Uh, this is a very flexible way to do that, and OPC UA uh, pops up MQTT can uh, help establishing this in a standard way by standardizing the message formats, the payload of the messages, uh, the uh, topic trees, uh, how the data is organized in the MQTT broker, and also the uh, how the uh, information models are used in this context. This work is uh, is ongoing at the moment, and and we will uh, hopefully get uh, get good uh, alternative specifications for those coming up. And uh, all of this can then enable new use cases. Uh, we already have analytics applications, visualization applications, and so on and so on. But uh, but now uh, it will be much easier to connect new 
uh, systems to this communication because you don't need to make it connected to everything, just connected to the uh, common communication bus. So, as a summary, OPC UA is very well designed for both IT and OT communication. Uh, the client server works in traditional hierarchical communication the best. The publisher subscriber is set for new requirements, and uh, we see that uh, the IT and OT networks are getting uh, more and more connected and, and mixed up. We have the cloud connectivity uh, requirement already. We have new requirements for the field level communication, and uh, this info bus can uh, like merge the IT and OT securely together in future. And security is always available, which is very, very important in all communications, especially when we when we do this kind of merging of, of the different uh, network segments. Yeah, so with this, I, I hope that you got a good idea how OPC UA can help you in your future uh, requirements and uh, and your future architecture for your for your own production site. Thank you very much. Hi, this is Joni from Process OPC. In this uh, presentation, I will uh, explain you the differences between the OPC UA client server and uh, publisher subscriber communication. So, in the uh, traditional uh, OPC UA client server, uh, we are talking about direct one to one connections between the applications. The other one acts as a server, the other one acts as a client. And uh, the major thing here is that uh, these connections are always session based, and the session has uh, a lot of uh, advantages, like we can authenticate uh, the applications with each other and then all the uh, further. Uh, communication, we know who is who is communicating with who. Whereas in the new publisher subscriber model, up sub as we call it, uh, we're talking about the many to many connection. And uh, here the idea is that all the participants, publishers and subscribers, they connect to a common network. And uh, we have two varieties. We have the UDP variety of the pop sub where uh, the network is a standard Ethernet network, and uh, the publishers publish data using UDP broadcasts. And the subscribers can just listen. Everybody gets all the all the broadcasted messages, and then they can pick up what they what they want from that. And then we have the other uh, alternative, the MQTT uh, pops up, and uh, there we're using an MQTT broker, which kind of acts as a network or common. Uh, server actually where all the components connect the publishers and the subscribers both connect to the mqtt broker and that one uh, delivers all the published messages to all the subscribers now uh, if we look at the data changes and event notifications which is the basic data and the monitoring that uh, that the applications do within each other we already have this established in the client server communication through also subscriptions. And uh, the issue there is that uh, these subscriptions are uh, defined separately for each client. It's a good thing that the client, every client can define what they want from the server, but uh, the servers need to take care of all the clients separately. So when we add another server, we get another set of uh, subscriptions. And if we get more clients, the servers just get a bit uh, loaded with uh, handling all the all the connections to the clients. Whereas in the PubSub model, uh, the publishing is per publisher, so the publisher doesn't need to care how many listeners it has. It just publishes its own data uh, to the network, and that gets uh, delivered to the subscribers. And we have another publisher, and that publishes. Uh, to the same network and it also gets 
uh, published to all the all the subscribers. The main difference here is that the configuration is then done on the publisher and the subscribers cannot like define anything specific for themselves. So they depend on dependent on what has already been defined in the publisher to be sent to the network. So these are the basic uh, differences between these, these two models. Now the additional uh, difference uh, and advantage of the client server technology is that we have these uh, additional uh, services that are available in the server and together with the uh, data changes, I would say these uh, make up the bi-directional uh, services. But here we're talking about the ability to browse the server address space to find out what kind of uh, network of, of data the server has available, what are all the tags there, for example, to discover the, the data available and uh, also to discover the information models that the, that the server supports. The clients can also read, write, call methods and do history reads to the servers. And these are basically missing from the pops up, but uh, we have now uh, actions coming up which are more or less methods, method calls. And we have ways to uh, work up with information models with the pops up coming up. Security. Uh, is available in is all scenarios, but uh, but it's a little bit different as well. In the client server model, we have the security on three different layers. We have the transport level, application level, and user level security. In the transport level, uh, we can encrypt all the messages. And then uh, on the application level, we can authenticate and decide which client can read, which client can, uh, can write, and call methods and so on. And we can also take this to the user level. So in addition to the client, we can also uh, identify the different users that have given their credentials on the client application. In PubSub UDP, uh, we need to divert to an external uh, component called security key server that will be able to share the security keys between these components so that they can uh, encrypt data uh, that is going from publishers to the subscribers. In MQTT, we can use the uh, security mechanisms provided by the MQTT brokers. Uh, they can support transport level security over SSL by default, and they can also use uh, broker authentication to, to define uh, username, passwords, or user security uh, certificates that, that are used to uh, identify the, the applications that connect. So both publishers and subscribers connect to the MQTT broker with this. But the publishers have no way to understand and limit uh, which subscribers connect to the broker and which subscribers get data. So these are the basic, basic differences. Many applications will in practice use both models because they have their both uh, their own benefits. Uh, we can have a publisher server that is a combination of a server and a publisher and uh, a subscriber client. Uh, and this uh, in this case, the client uh, subscriber client can use the client functionality to configure the server, for example, or to browse the address space to find out uh, what's what's available and then it can uh, subscribe to the data that is being published by the publisher server. We can also have a publisher client that uh, converts to the client server communication to pop sub, for example, or the subscriber server, which uh, converts it the other way around. Many applications can have uh, all of these uh, functionalities and, uh, and with those means we get the most efficient uh, options and, and uh, uh, combinations of, of functionalities in, in them. So as a summary, uh, OPC UA client server has uh, the bidirectional services that, uh, that stand out, but it's only moderately uh, scalable, which is maybe uh, a drawback, whereas the PubSub model uh, enables better scalability, but uh, on the other hand is uh, so far only unidirectional communication. We have the UDP version which uh, provides the maximum throughput of data 
and we have the MQTT, which is very flexible on uh, this kind of more unreliable networks and, and deliver it to the cloud especially. But both are required, both are useful, and uh, security is always available. So uh, you have all the options that you need. And uh, I hope with this presentation you got a better understanding with, uh, with the differences between these crucial technologies. Thank you. Hello everybody, this is Derek from Matricon, and in this session I'm going to talk about how you bring in information models into an OPC UA server and then how you can go about using that. So first of all, information models are typically put together into a companion specification where they serve a specific purpose, whether it's for a given industry or just a specific application. And companion specifications are composed of uh, two key components. Number one, they have a node set file, which is an XML file. That's what's consumed by the software uh, as it reads it in. And also a description that's human readable, and that's basically a PDF. Uh, you can get a lot of information about which uh, companion specifications are available currently from the OPC Foundation website. If you want to jump to that, you can just use the QR code shown on the side. Now, OPC UA servers can then read in those XML files or the node set files. And depending on how your OPC UA server was written by the vendor, uh, if it does have the ability to read in a companion specification, it will either do so through a command line parameter where you're reading it in as you're starting up the server, or it may have an interface where you can actually dynamically uh, identify which companion specifications you want to load, and then it will load those. So that really is uh, implementation specific. OK, so for the demonstration that I'm going to run in this session, uh, I will use Matricon software. We're going to be talking to a Matricon data broker, which is the, the key component that actually allows you to read in those information models, the, the node set files, and then lets you map them to various data sources so you can start using the, the model. We'll be using OPC UA Explorer as the GUI, as the, the interface. And uh, what that will look like is like that. So basically we will use that as the front end, but basically all the true activity is actually happening below in the data broker. All right, so the steps I'm going to walk through in this demonstration are number one, I'm going to load a node set file, I'm going to instantiate a type, in this case a boiler type. I'm going to map data from a simulated data source to it, and then we're going to monitor those values just to see that, hey, it, uh, it actually works. So let's get started with that. So the first thing we're going to do in Explorer is go to the import uh, section. So that's under the instance management. On the right hand side, we're going to click on import and identify where the node set file is. So in this case, I already have it downloaded, so we'll uh, select the, the file for the, for the boiler uh, companion specification, pull it in, validate it. Once it's read in, it's added into our address space. So now the types that were defined there, as you can see on the left as we scroll, you, we can find the boiler type and we have it. And the next thing we want to do is now instantiated so that we actually have an object or an instance that we can um, work with. So we identify several attributes for it because of what you're doing is taking a type that's now in your address space. It defines what that structure would look like. And now you have to instantiate it and you have to identify how that's going to plug into the address space. So where on the tree in your address space you will actually uh, attach it to, where is it going to sit in that? So now once we've done that on the left, you can see again, we're looking now at the instances. So we identify or we choose uh, the, the type, the, the boiler type. And the next thing that we're going to do now is run through and identify a data source on the left. And we're going to map that to 
one of the uh, attributes of that object, of the boiler object. So right now, scrolling through, just identifying uh, where I'm going to choose some values that are going to be dynamically updating, just so we can see some, some values that are actually changing. And once we select that, we go to the right side and we basically follow the pattern of mapping from source on the left to destination on the right. So now when I uh, browse through the address space again and I get to the particular attribute I want to choose uh, from the boiler and I want to say, OK, I would like to map uh, between that source and this destination. When that mapping is done, we also want to give it a name uh, so we can identify which mappings we have created. And we'll basically go through and do this for, let's say, a couple more. So we'll have three different attributes that we've mapped. So now that we have those three attributes mapped, we can go back and take a look at our data view. And when we browse through our address space now, looking for the actual values, uh, we again browse down to uh, our instance of boiler, our demo boiler, and we basically identify the the types we can either choose individual nodes to monitor, or you can drop the entire object in, like I did here. And that starts to uh, basically, it'll pull in all the nodes and, and break them out in the view. And we can see that the, the three that we mapped are now updating uh, from the original underlying data source. The nice thing with this is that you can now uh, access that underlying information via this information model, and hence you're putting it to, uh, to good use. All right, so that uh, in a nutshell is how you load an information model, how you map it uh, to a particular data source, and then how you can start to work with it. So I uh, hope you found this useful and uh, talk to you next time. Thanks. Hi everybody, this is Alexander again from the OPC Foundation European Certification Test Lab. But today I don't want to talk about certification. Today I actually like to talk about a different topic where you probably came across um, if you have something to do with engineering of systems, for example. And what I want to build it up with first is, of course, the use case. So we look at a specific um, scenario. In our scenario here, we're looking at the building automation. So we're looking at a boiler inside a facility and the whole life cycle of that. And what you have is during the whole life cycle, you do have a different, you sometimes have different names uh, for the same set of information. So while the boiler in the um, building plan has a certain name, it has an actual different name in the OPC UA server that then has the set of information because the temperature sensor in that boiler is from a certain vendor and you usually cannot modify the address space or information model of those sensors. So it's a fixed um, information model and therefore a fixed node ID. And then also it usually scales up. So you don't just have the information once, but you have similar information uh, for different buildings multiple times. And now you often have the question, how can I correlate those alternate names or those aliases with the um, OPC UA information that I have in the information model in my OPC UA service? 
So it is about finding the information in your overall system, and it could be a specific UA node, so just for a very specific boiler, or you probably want to have the whole set of information collected from your whole system, so from all the boilers in all the buildings in your campus. And luckily, OPC UA has a solution for that, and the solution is called alias names. So with alias names, you really can assign an OPC UA node an alias, so an alternate name or multiple names. That basically means that the name you have in your building plan, like boiler underscore A23.1 underscore temperature, which would be the information of the temperature in that boiler A23.1, um, you can assign that a different name or you could point it to the exact um, information in the address space of the OPC UA server, which in our example here is the boiler one temperature. What it also allows you to do is you can make use of wildcards in order to search and query the whole um, database of those alternate names to get a specific set of information. So you can create a search pattern, for example, like boiler percent temperature, and that would eliminate the or wildcard the underscore a23.1 underscore and provide you therefore all the information um, of temperature values from any boilers in your system. Now, as you can imagine, the same thing would also work with redundant systems. So if you have redundant systems having the same information in their information model, then you can actually um, query the alias name server for the node IDs. And what you will get back is a pointer to both servers with the redundant information um, with the exact node ID. So you can locate the information in the address space of those servers and you can collect the information from the one with the uh, most accurate value at that point in time. So this is also something that you can do with alias names. So what is alias names? Short summary here. Uh, alias name server is a system wide repository of OPC UA nodes. So it really has aggregated all the servers, address spaces from your, all the systems that you have. And this really allows you to do such wildcard searches and find the exact information that you're looking for. It is a translation from alternate names to certain OPC UA nodes, and that includes the OPC UA server aspect that you need to connect to to get the information, as well as the exact node ID um, in this specific server to get the process value. And as I already pointed out, the alias name server is not an aggregator for process value, so it just points you to the information. It doesn't provide it directly to you. Now, having this said, of course, you could come up with an aggregation server which combines both features. So it is um, providing you the alias names, the alternate names, as well as um, aggregating the process values. Of course, that would be also a reasonable implementation of alias names. So I really hope that this helps you in your whole architecturing of your um, yeah, systems and that you can leverage from this information. So if you want to have more information about alias names, please check the OPC UA specifications. Thank you. Hello and welcome everybody to this presentation about OPC UA and security. My name is Christopher Anhalt. I work as Vice President Product Marketing for Softing Industrial and I'm glad about this opportunity to represent the OPC Foundation. As you may have heard already, um, unfortunately I have a runny nose today. Uh, sorry about that, but I hope you can hear and understand me fine nonetheless. 
We all understand that um, many IoT applications, IoT solutions require access to machine data, or in other words, access to machine data has become relevant throughout the enterprise. And in order not to create any additional security risks, um, the communication of that data, access to data has to be secure. This means security, uh, first of all, has to be flexible, as um, no two IoT solutions are the same, as IoT solutions often change over time. Um, security has to adapt flexibly to um, all these different um, um, solution scenarios. And that means security, for example, has to support a range of different data sources and devices. Uh, security has to support different applications and associated user roles. Um, there has to be security um, within complex network topologies and security needs to provide ways to deal with a large number of client and server applications connected in the solution. The second need um, is cost. Of course, security comes as a cost. There is a trade-off between effort, cost, and level of security, and security mechanisms in the solution um, need to be cost-effective so that they can be um, applied successfully. And the third aspect here, and that's um, if you want on a separate level, um, I mentioned already um, IoT solutions change over time, also security threats are a moving target and change over, over time, and that means that a security solution that may be considered secure today may no, no longer be secure, for example, in two years or three years from now on. So the user needs to um, have processes and mechanisms available uh, which allow the user to keep the security um, of the solution up to date, which means there have to be software updates, um, including fixes, maybe also new security features, which can be um, deployed um, in the future. Now, which are the security features um, that OPCUA offers um, to users? First, um, it has to be noted that OPCUA doesn't try to reinvent the security wheel. OPCUA uses, reuses, leverages um, security mechanisms which have been proven elsewhere, of course, most notably in, in the IT industry. And OPC takes these mechanisms and applies them in a three-level um, security model. There is application-level security using certificates. There is user-level security um, to ensure authentication of users here, again, using certificates. And there is so-called transport-level security, which means that two OPCUA components um, can encrypt communication. Uh, for those of you who know here uh, security, the terms we are talking here about X509 certificates, for example, um, transport layer security um, standards. Now, these, um, these points here make sure that users um, can work with the rock-solid security model, can use state-of-the-art security in their solution. A second aspect or third aspect here, counting bullets, is uh, um, the choice that OPCU provides regarding uh, security algorithms. Again, you can imagine there's a trade-off between um, security level and um, resource requirements, um, memory computing power, and offering a choice here means that users can select the correct algorithms for a given device. In particular, uh, for embedded um, systems with limited memory, with limited computing power, it is also possible to, um, to implement OPCA functionality um, on such systems. And last but not least, um, OPCA makes all these security features configurable. Users do not have to use all the features all the time, which again would come at a cost. Instead, users can select and turn on those features um, which are um, relevant and should be used in their um, given situation, in their given project. Let's take a closer look at one specific situation, and this is the question how to deal with potentially a large number of, um, uh, of components here, a large number of um, data sources, and also maybe a couple of client devices, as you can see here in the picture at the left-hand side here. Um, sensors, PLCs, devices at the bottom, clients at the top, and connecting each application individually to all these data sources 
means that potentially a lot of application, a large number of, um, sorry, um, a lot of connections need to be configured. And that means effort. And the effort can be reduced by employing here an additional component in the middle, um, an OPC or aggregation server, which can take all these many OPC UA data sources and make them available through a single um, server interface to the application. So an application has to be configured only against one single um, OPC UA server instead of hundreds or maybe even thousands. And the second aspect of that image is um, and I'm coming back to configuration, um, that it may not be necessary to use all security features here um, in the communication between a device and the integration server. Uh, maybe authentication is enough, but you do not need um, encryption. But most likely you want to use full security uh, when, communing with, when communicating with a client application and that server in particular, for example, if you want to connect a cloud-based IoT platform. So such a component is, is a key component um, which can help to, um, to reduce overall complexity, uh, complexity of a solution and which can help to reduce maintenance and, and configuration efforts and hence uh, which can keep the cost of operation um, down. Last remark on that slide, um, these components uh, don't exist only on PowerPoint. Uh, you can buy a so-called secure integration server from Softin, and you can buy similar products from some of our competitors. So all this is commercially available um, today. To summarize, OPCUA, the OPCUA standard leverages established and proven IT security standards. It uh, doesn't reinvent the security wheel. OPCUA security offers flexibility, in particularly OPCUA security scales with the solution. You can connect um, many devices, a huge number of data sources in an efficient way. And on a separate level, the OPC Foundation provides a forum <clears throat> for its members, for users to discuss security, and it helps its members um, to keep security of the solution up to date throughout the entire lifecycle. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is Derek from Matricon, and in this session, I'll be talking about firewall traversal using OPC UA Reverse Connect. So one of the challenges that are faced in industry is the ability to communicate down to the shop floor to get that data up into the business networks or into the cloud, and doing that in a secure fashion. If you just open up the firewall inbound port for the OT network, what happens is, as shown in the diagram, you can connect with the OPC UA client down to the shop floor, to the OPC UA servers. However, you're also exposing your network to risk since you have an open inbound port. Of course, if you shut that port down without any other strategy, well, then you've got no connectivity, so that doesn't work. So when you use OPC UA reverse connect, what happens is a two-step process. First of all, you actually have the OPC UA server call up to the OPC UA client, indicating that it wants to start a connection. By doing so, that connection is now open and the OPC UA client then creates a session, a secure session talking back down to that server. This way, you've got the call initiated from the shop floor. You could keep the inbound firewall uh, port closed and you've got the bi-directional communications if you want from the client down to the server. So fairly simple principle, and actually it's just this easy to use. And you get data from both sides. So uh, what, you, what do you need? Well, if you take a look at uh, the reverse connection, then really when you're configuring it, number one, uh, when on the server side, you just need to indicate where you want that server to reverse, reverse call out to. Uh, in order to initiate that communication. And number two, on the client side, wherever that will be, you need to indicate where the client should be listening, what port it should listen on, and 
where to expect that reverse call to come through. One key thing to, to note is that you are still using the regular security protocol to actually then establish the secure session between the client and the server. So even though you are doing a reverse call to the client, you still follow the same process after that in order to connect the client to the server. It's just that you're using the connection that the server made. So this is a standard feature of OPC UA, and uh, it's built into a number of uh, products. So for example, uh, vendors like Matricon, uh, Unified Automation, Process, they all uh, already implemented this both in their SDKs uh, or our SDKs uh, to enable developers who are creating OPC UA applications to uh, automatically be able to use uh, Reverse Connect. And it's also in our products. So for example, for Matricon, we're using Data Broker in our Explorer, and same goes for uh, Unified Automation and also for Process Software. So next, what I'll do is I'll show you a demo of uh, how you actually would see this in action, how you would set up a Reverse Connect call to get that communication going across a firewall. So what we'll do here is I'm going to set up a simple network where I've got a data broker sitting on the south side of the firewall, so basically the more secure area, and then the explorer sitting on the north side trying to communicate. So first what we're going to do is try to establish a regular connection with, uh, of course, the fire, uh, firewall ports closed. So we identify, we type in that we want to connect, identify the address for the data broker, wait for it to connect, and you fail because the port is closed, so you can't, you can't make that connection. So next, I select reverse connect in order to indicate that I'm going to be waiting for reverse connect call, and I use the address of where that will be coming from uh, for the, uh, for the, from the data broker, and also what port to listen on, and now it's open and waiting to uh, hear that connection. Now switching over to the data broker side, I'm using an explorer that's sitting on the south side of that firewall. And again, I need to configure it. So first I log into data broker. So connecting with just the regular client and in our software, we call it Firebridge, but it is using reverse connect. So I come in and I give a name to the reverse connect connection because if you have a number of them, it's nice to be able to customize what that's going to be called. And again, identify where it's going to call out to. So in this case, I'm typing in the IP address that's going up to the Explorer sitting north of the firewall. And also you can indicate that when you want to reconnect in case you lose connection and then you enable it. So now uh, taking a look at the, the north side, I've got an indicator that I'm trying to connect, uh, that I've, I've received the reverse connect from the server. And when I select my uh, method of uh, uh, connecting, uh, so the security method, and I type in my uh, credentials, because you always want to connect securely, I come in and I try to connect but uh, because we haven't connected yet before, we still haven't trusted the certificates. So again, we have to go back and now to the, north, the south side where the data broker is in order to trust that certificate. So in Explorer, you could just choose the certificate that came in, take a look at uh, you know, what the certificate looks like if you need to examine it. Everything looks okay, so we accept it. And as soon as that certificate is now accepted, the data broker continues to reverse connect or set up that session uh, the connection with uh, Explorer across the firewall, the data starts, uh, the, the connectivity is already set up. Explorer makes the, sets up the session. And as you can see now, uh, going through uh, on in the Explorer, browsing the address space of the data broker down below, identifying some items that are of interest. We can just uh, maybe grab uh, a few of them here and drag them in to the, to the data window. And next thing you know, you've got data coming in from data broker uh, up into Explorer. And that's it, it's that easy. So as I mentioned, uh, very important to note that you uh, are still using full blown security. So even though we did the reverse connect uh, to set up that call, the session actually is set up the, the, the usual way. And of course we use uh, uh, encryption methods to, to or encryption in order to uh, to ensure that the data is safe. And if the connection was lost, as soon as you reconnect, the data broker would then go back and uh, reconnect again and continue um, working as it, as it did before. All right, so that's that's how you talk security across a firewall to share your uh, shop floor data uh, without exposing your your networks to undue risk.
All right, so thanks for watching and hope you found this useful. Uh, talk to you again. Bye bye. Hey, it's Alexander again, and this time I'd like to talk about certificate management because certificates is what OPC UA heavily uses for all the secure mechanisms that we have. Now, whenever we talk about um, security, then the folks from or the security experts are quite interested in the details or are very strict on the details. And therefore, we do have some implications here because I want to keep the recording short or the session short and therefore I'm outlining some of the things. So um, take a minute to pause the video here and go through the slide because I will skip it for now. When talking about OPC UA security, we do have different options for handling the certificates. Of course, you can go with a self-signed certificate, which is what most applications are using by default in the beginning. So when they fire up the first time, and they start themselves, then they generate a self-signed certificate if no certificate has yet been assigned to them. In such a case, the issuer is basically the application itself. So it assists itself that it's uh, trustworthy. The problem or the downside with such self-signed certificates is that you always need to trust them individually. So you need to make sure that the server is aware of all the clients which are going to connect to him and have all of them separately in its trust list, as well as the clients need the server certificates. Now, the problem with that is that depending on what kind of application you're looking at, for PLCs, for example, this sometimes even means that you need to restart your um, PLC program. So this is not necessarily the best, and it becomes even worse from a management perspective, because you won't just have one application or three applications as in this example, but you probably have like tens of clients as well as hundreds of servers. And you basically end up walking with a USB stick through um, your facility and copy those certificates individually into the trust lists. Now you can see that this is not necessarily good from a maintenance perspective, but luckily certificate management with OPC UA, just like any other certificate management, has a solution for that. And we are utilizing a, um, a concept from the industry, which is certificate authorities, so-called CAs. Now CAs allow to structure certificate hierarchies. So what you can do is you can um, have a, a root, CA as we have it here in the example. You have intermediate CAs um, to just have a better organization and then you have the so-called leaf CAs that is then the C, um, not CA but certificate and they are then really for the individual applications. So we can now create some structure and what you already see on the right hand side is that of course any CA or intermediate CA can issue multiple other um, certificates. So in this example here, we're talking about a factory north and a factory south. So the beauty here is it really eases the organization of trust relationships and allows a big number of variations and different scenarios to be addressed, as well as having a central management for those certificates. So let's walk through the different CA scenarios that we have. Now, what you could do is you can put a CAA certificate into a trust list. What this would result in is that every certificate which is issued by the CA will be automatically trusted for incoming connections. So at the end, what happens here is that the server application in our example will accept any client application, no matter whether they are coming from the factory north, the factory south, or from any other factory. Now, obviously, this is usually not necessarily the scenario that you want to have in your facility because you want to protect yourself against, um, for example, lost notebooks or um, applications, uh, devices which have been moved from one facility to another. So you want to reduce the number of allowed incoming connections. And you can do that by 
um, the so-called issuer trust lists or the issuer lists, um, which would have a slightly different meaning. So what you see here is that the root CA is not at the end, not anymore in the trust list, but instead it's placed in the certificate folder of the issues. The reason for that is that with OPC UA, you're always required to have um, the complete certificate chain validated on incoming connections. So you need to know that the signature in the certificate that is being sent to you matches the one that you're expecting. So you need to have um, an option to verify this. The intermediate CA in our scenario here is then placed in the trust list um, in the search folder. And now what happens here is that all certificates issued by the factory NOV CA will now be accepted for incoming connections. So when an HMI from Factory South tries to connect or a maintenance notebook from Factory South or any other factory, it would not be allowed to connect to, to the OPC UA server. And this is something that is a more common scenario in the industry. Of course, for very strict um, access um, control, you could also have uh, the leaf certificates in the trust list. So you can basically just add that for any level, the whole concept that we just described for every level in your um, hierarchy. So now what we're doing is we only want to allow incoming connection from HMI A to our OPC UA server. So what we're doing is we place the HMI A application certificate into the search trust folder and we make the other two, so the factory North CA as well as the company root CA available um, in the issuers folders. Now this allows us to validate a complete chain while only allowing incoming connections by HMI A. So you see that you can always also just handle very strict uh, requirements here. Now I want to finish off with just some um, yeah, brief explanations or a short summary on uh, example that we all know from our daily lives, which is comparing the certificate strategies that we have right here between the IT and um, us in the OT. So I think that all of us are used to utilize mail servers as well as web servers. Now, what is the big difference here? The difference here is that you have a global trust list. So basically you have certain authorities which are known to be trusted because they validate the receiver of a certificate before they issue it. For example, like VeriSign, GlobalSign and others. And what happens now is that when you use a browser and you go to such a website, it will validate, the browser will validate that the certificate being sent by the um, web server is matching your expectations. So basically the URL you're trying to access. Now on the web server side, they will basically allow any incoming certificate. And this is a big difference here to the OT because in the OT, what we are doing, of course, is we want to establish trust um, specific between two uh, certain applications. So for us, accepting any incoming connection is usually not the way that you want to go. The other main difference here is that um, because of the in the ITD requirement that all those different browsers can have access to those certificate authorities and to those issues, um, they need to be maintained by those companies, which also involves costs. Now on the OT side, the end user, the operator is the one who is controlling the certificate management. So it's also the company that is controlling DCAs and therefore the whole thing is self-managed and uh, the costs are now depending on the solution the end user chooses. Now, if they want to have something by themselves, they can do that without having any costs. So you can issue as many certificates as you like by your, your own CA structure without any implications or any kind of warnings that um, this is an untrusted um, CA once you have it in a trust list, obviously. Now with OPC UA, you already have heard that um, having a big scenario with a lot of different OPC UA applications is a big problem here because uh, the maintenance is quite high. Now, um, this is actually also the kind of the case with IT. So when you um, need to renew a certificate for a web server, then you need to go to your issuer again. So to the company which uh, provided you the certificate and you need to repurchase a renewal and then update your web server. 
Now with OT um, and OPC UA, all of that is standardized by using the, um, the GDS, which we already heard about from Randy Armstrong in the um, security sessions, as well as from Jim Louf in his uh, global services session. So OPC UA really helps here, and that is basically where I want to go to with my summary. The certificate management via this GDS is very simple and easy because that really eases the maintenance here quite a lot. With having all the different um, structures that like self-signed and um, certificate authorities, you can have um, a different or a big number of different scenarios covered. And the important thing he here is to state that the support for both self-signed certificate as well as CAs is required and therefore be supported by all compliant OPC UA products. And also a very important detail, there's no way around the certificate management, so you need to uh, make yourself aware of it because security is mandated in OPC UA. Now, in the past, we had some exceptions for really tiny um, resource restricted devices, which could not do or handle RSA operations. But now with having ECC into built into the standard, those exceptions are not valid anymore. And therefore, security is now required for all kind of applications out there. I really hope that this helped getting your um, head around OPC certificate management and uh, that you enjoyed this session. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is Johnny from Process, and in uh, this presentation I will introduce you the Global Discovery Server of OPC UA. Uh, Global Discovery Server, the GDS in short, is, is a new component that you can use uh, in your production site in addition to the uh, other applications which hopefully are OPC UA enabled. The GDS has uh, a couple of uh, main functionalities. The first of all, uh, it's an application registry, which means that uh, it knows about all the OPC UA applications on the site and helps therefore to locate them uh, in other applications. The second uh, major uh, feature of the GDS is certificate manager. So it enables you to uh, manage all the OPC UA certificates uh, of the applications in a central location. Uh, the GDS can uh, implement also additional functionalities like authorization services or OPC UA access tokens. It can uh, include key credential management, uh, especially for accessing uh, MQTT brokers, for example, where it can. Uh, leverage uh, functionalities also of uh, external uh, credential uh, services uh, through the OAuth uh, 2 protocol, for example. It can also uh, function as an ADS server, explained in, uh, in the presentations uh, regarding ADS names in a separate presentation. And uh, it can also uh, function as a security key server for the PubSub UDP communication in practice. But in this presentation, I'm, I'm concentrating on the first two, the main, main functionalities. So the application registry is uh, simply uh, where all the applications that are OPC UA uh, capable to register themselves including their connection addresses and capabilities. So after this, uh, the client applications can, uh, can find them and find information about them and uh, can then connect with the provided addresses. 
The other uh, main functionality is the certificate manager. And in uh, this role, uh, the GDS can function as a certificate authority, or it can be a front end to a certificate authority that is somewhere, somewhere behind it. But in this uh, case, it uh, provides standard OPC UI interfaces for using the certificate authority features. And these are in practice managed by the site administrator. And the site administrator defines which applications are accepted to this network of trusted applications. And the trust is uh, defined using these application uh, instance certificates that the uh, GDS will issue for, for the OPC UI applications. And, and the idea here is that uh, once the GDS has issued these, it's, uh, it signs these certificates, and then the applications in this network can, uh, can share the trust with each other so that they can automatically trust any application that the GDS uh, has issued. And you don't need to like uh, define this trust chip uh, one by one uh, for for every application separately. And this is especially useful uh, since uh, now we can start updating uh, the certificates as well, and the updates can happen automatically per application, and every other application can then automatically uh, retrust these new certificates that the that the applications get. And this in practice enables shorter uh, uh, validity times for the, for the certificates so that the, the certificates are renewed. And this is, of course, very important for the overall security that the certificates don't need to be created for, for too long a period. Uh, the GDS also takes care of trust list management. This means uh, lists of uh, valid and invalid certificates. So in practice, uh, we talk about revocation lists uh, when, uh, when the GDS has issued already certificate for some application and, and later on that application wants to be, or we want to remove that application from the uh, trusted applications, then the site administrator can define that this uh, certificate shouldn't be trusted anymore. And then it's important to deliver this information to the other applications which thought that they can trust it because it's issued by the GDS, but they need this uh, revocation list uh, to be updated so that uh, they know that, okay, there's an exception. I, I shouldn't trust this application anymore. And these changes are then delivered automatically also to the applications through the uh, GDS protocol. Now, the communication between the GDS and the other OPC UI applications can happen in, uh, in two different alternative ways. The first one uh, we call the pool model. And in this uh, model, the GDS is an OPC UI server. So the client applications can especially uh, use it. And in this role, it implements the, the GDS information model that is defined in the OPC UI specifications. And here you can see an example of what the uh, address space of the GDS looks like. And the client applications can then uh, call these uh, or find the information from the address space. And they can call methods and they can browse the address space to find a list of uh, applications that are registered in there. And they can update their own uh, certificates and trust lists from the GDS. In the push model, on the other hand, the GDS is an OPC UI client, and it uh, kind of expects that the server applications implement the GDS information model for push model, uh, which is defined to enable the GDS to be able to update the certificates to the server applications. So as a summary, uh, the OPC UA Global Discovery Server, GDS, is a key component for site-wide security management. And here the application registry 
helps to locate and manage all of these UA applications on site. Uh, but it can also have other functionalities, uh, taking care of access tokens, uh, ADS names. It can act, act as a security key server, which will be important for the PubSec UDP security. And also it can uh, be a storage for key credentials, uh, especially for MQTT brokers, but probably also for other, other services. So uh, I hope with this presentation, I, I gave you a quick uh, introduction to, uh, to what the GDS is, and, uh, and now you can uh, like start expecting to, to use such a product in your own production site. So thank you for this, and hope that uh, you will enjoy the other presentations as well. Hi, my name is Uwe Steinkraus and uh, I work for Unified Automation. We are doing software development kits for OPC UA client and server development. Today I want to talk about um, the scan rate versus publish rate and why we need it and how to optimize the settings for those. First of all, um, whenever doing data acquisition the dilemma is that we have different use cases and different requirements that we need to fulfill. And one is for control applications and analytics. We typically need a constant stream of data or time series of data that we call raw data. Then we have the HMI SCADA that typically wants to have the latest only for quick reaction. Um, and then we have dashboard applications that are interested in changes only uh, or maybe threshold only to present the data to an end user. And furthermore, um, we have the database, uh, which typically needs a consistent set of data um, or triggered data at a certain point in time or for a certain value. And that's what's called a data set that you need for recording. And all these use cases can be fulfilled with OPC UA. And as you know, OPC UA data flow goes from the server to the client, and the client is a data consumer, and the server is a data provider. And the communication between when the data flows from the server to the client, and that's what we call the publish. And the scan is the communication between the data source and the server. And uh, there can be an event source or a data source or both inside the server. And typically it's inside the server because the OPC server is directly on the device that is uh, having the data. And now what typically happens is that you have the request from the client coming in, requested scan rate and requested publish rate and the server is answering with a revised scan rate and re revised publish rate. And that's important because the revised value is that what's really happening. After that, the client will send the publish token and then the server will send all the data that has changed in the publish response. This is why the arrow is a little bit bigger because it, that's the large message with all the data contained. And then the client is sending again a token and the server is sending again a publish if the data has changed and whenever received by the client sending a new token. And then we are in this kind of ping pong mode uh, with request and response in a publish. And the publish rate and the scan rate, that's what is defined by the server and it's for protection of overloading the source. And we look into details now. 
So as you know from the Nyquist Shannon theorem for signal reconstruction, you need to scan the data with twice the speed and of the frequency. And of course this may cause some load in the server. The publish causes load on the traffic, so it's important for the bandwidth, it's the network traffic. And as you can see on the left, I'm scanning or sampling the data at quite low speed and the publish is even slower. And then um, you're detecting the change, so the green that's the original signal and the red is the replication of it. And on the right side you can see if I sample the data faster and even have faster publishes, then I'm pretty close to the original signal when uh, reconstructing it. And so this always happens if you scan the data. Another point you need to consider is that the two loops of the scan rate and the publish rate are probably unsynchronized. So if there is inaccuracy in the timing loop, then sometimes it may happen that you scan the data, you just get the new value, but unfortunately the publish is just going away a few uh, milliseconds before and you need to wait for the next one. So this is all about the timer accuracy. The server implementation on that side we call the sampling engine. Its uh, implementation is server specific. So different servers can be implemented different. So you have an event source or an in-memory source. Typically an in-memory source is pulled by the server internally uh, because it's in-memory anyway. And the event source uh, is firing the event directly. All this is what we call the sampling engine. You need to consider that some servers may have an external source and that means uh, that there is maybe another protocol involved that is uh, beneath the server to the final device that has the data. And there of course it's also important depending on the external source if it needs to be pulled or if it can uh, event driven send the data to the server. And the good thing is we have two timestamps, the source timestamp and the server timestamp in order to figure out uh, where the data was created at what point in time. And this we can use also for the short signal detection. Because if we have a very short signal here in green and we scan it, as you can see it on the left, that it may happen that we miss the data. So we miss the first one here in our scan rate. We scan the data and it was zero. And the second one we scan it again and it's again zero. And the peak in the middle we have not detected. However, the second zero that is coming, that has a different timestamp. So, if we subscribe for the notification, not only for the value or status, but also for timestamp, then we will get this information with this timestamp. And another option is the event-driven source, where we have a scan rate of typically zero to activate that. And then, uh, whenever the data is changed in the source, uh, then the source is notifying already the server and the server is then packing that into the published response and sending it uh, to the client. And then we have replicated the information again, including, of course, the preservation of the original timestamp at the source. Now you can test that out using UA Expert, um, a tool you maybe already know. Um, here I have a simulation server connected and on the left I drag and drop uh, my byte here for reporting into the data access view, then it's subscribed for reporting mode and here I can see the published values coming in including the timestamp, in this case time source stamp and server timestamp is identical because it's a simulation server. Um, and it owns its own data. If you right click on the item, 
then you can per each item request a different sampling interval and then you need to look here at the bottom into the uh, log window what about the revised sampling interval that the server is returning because that's what's really going to happen. Um, and another hint here, you have this refresh icon here, you can directly read the attributes. So that's then outside of the subscription mechanism of OPC. It's just an ad hoc read of all the attributes, including the value attribute and of course the timestamps, both timestamps plus the status code. Another good example of these features uh, can be seen with the data logger view. In, in UA Expert, here I have also drag and drop the same item here, the dynamic byte, which is incremented all the time. And I have a publish interval of 1000 milliseconds, one second. Um, and I'm getting 412 samples, uh, which I receive in 26 uh, publishes. And this is because the sampling rate is zero, so I'm sampling fast as possible. And I have configured uh, a queue uh, with a length of 20 values. So I can queue up to 20 values and I know that the data is moving in 50 milliseconds, so they will all fit in here. And then I, um, I get the block of data, um, the queue of data, all together in the publish every second. So I have a better uh, ratio on the network because it's not so much overhead. But I'm still getting all the values without any data loss. And I've selected the simulation activation item here um, so that on the right side I can write to the value true or false to start and stop the simulation. And if you stop the simulation here, then the value will not change anymore, so it will be frozen. And then of course the data is not changing. And what happens here, you can see that after five seconds I get the keep alive, which is also a publish message, but without any data, it's just an empty publish saying keep alive, uh, uh, which I get when the data is silent. And so I have still the control that the server is alive, it just has no data to send. So this is my summary on this topic. Um, OPC UA has mechanisms for different use cases and the scan rate and the publish rate needs to be considered. And when scan rate, you always need to think about load and on publish rate, you always need to think about traffic. And if you want to preserve bandwidth, of course, also uh, it's important for cost if you have to pay by traffic for example, on a satellite connection or if you uh, push data into a cloud where you need to pay the cloud by traffic, then this is important. And you can optimize the overhead to payload ratio if you send queued bulked data. So thank you very much for listening. Hi, my name is Uwe Steinkraus and I'm with Unified Automation. We are doing software development kits for OPC UA client and server development. Today I want to talk about the polling versus reporting mechanism inside OPC and where we see the difference of that. And typically um, you use OPC UA with notifying and you get notifications 
uh, for events or you can get notification for data. An event is some unconditional or conditional event that's fired and an alarm has a conditional state and even additional information and it can be acknowledged. But also data, as you all know, um, can be sent by notification. Uh, so you ask the server to uh, notify you if the data has a value or state change or even a timestamp change. And that's the normal uh, way how to use OPC UA uh, with a notification mechanism uh, to get the data. But there's also a possibility to read uh, the data. Uh, and it's a talk read, so if you need the data once, uh, or you can do it cyclic, which we then will call polling, which of course is more, uh, more stress for the server. So the use case makes a difference here. Um, so you need to consider um, that typically the client asking the server uh, with a very small token and then if the server um, has detected uh, change in the data uh, at the source then he will notify you with the publish. The publish is a big error here because it contains the data. Uh, with read that is different. With read you will send a quite large message from the client to the server because you need to give a list of all the nodes you want to read. So it's a quite large uh, message that you need to send containing that list. And then in a return you will get the data back for all these items you have asked for. So in both directions it's, uh, it's a big traffic. In the publish it's already optimized. Um, so that's what you need to consider. And second, of course, if you read um, on the server, um, then you may put load on the source. That depends on where you configure your max age. So when reading, you can define the max age. Um, and if the max age is now, then the server needs to grab the data directly from the source. So the read goes through directly onto the source. And of course this can um, create extra load if you do this at high frequency. Um, and there's another trick you can reduce a little bit um, this read request information uh, if you register the nodes, then you don't need to send the list of all the string node IDs, you send a list of all registered node IDs. And this makes it easier for the server to identify the nodes uh, which you want to read. Um, and so this message here, uh, the read request, will get smaller and the server can process it faster because it already contains the information, the, the registered information, and then he can send the data back more quickly. We will look to that in a detail. Here, as you may have already seen, is the UA expert um, with a performance view. And what you can see here is first I have connected the server, then I browse down uh, to the items I want to use for my test. Here I have a folder with 1000 uh, variables which I drag and drop into the list of nodes to be used for the test. As you can see here, it's a nodes I have in my testing list is uh, 1000 and uh, they each have uh, UIN32 uh, data type. And so that's the base for my test. And then I check here the read and the read registered uh, to show the difference in the reading mechanism. And now this client is going to read a hundred times in a loop. So this is polling at full speed, hundred times in the loop. 
and using a hundred, a five hundred, a thousand and a five thousand nodes per each read. And with that you can see here the curve coming out as a result saying that you can read the registered nodes uh, which is 5,000 registered nodes with UN32 values in a loop 100 times at an average of 6.5 milliseconds each uh, read. And if you do it without registering the nodes, then it will take as an average 9.4 milliseconds, as you can see here. So you can already measure that registering the nodes before reading them in a, in a fast loop really makes a difference. So this is the test where we uh, can see that uh, reading in a loop is extremely fast. Now I want to confer, uh, now I want to compare this to um, the subscription. So again the same test, I have my 1000 tags in here in my list to be used um, and I check here the subscribe uh, test that I want to run and the sampling interval is a zero, so I'm telling the server I want to have the fastest sampling and the publish interval is 50 milliseconds which is by the way the fastest this server can do because it's uh, returning the revised publish interval with 50. And now again I do the cycle of 100 which means I wait for 100 data changes per each item to occur and then I'm happy. Um, and I, I do my measurement. And what you can see here, um, independent of the number of items I have in my uh, publish, 100, 500, 1000, even 5000, it all the time takes an average of around 62 milliseconds. Even when I subscribe to 5000 nodes it's still 52 milliseconds. And what you can see from here is that the publish rate uh, needs to be interpreted as not faster than. So the data will not be faster than 50 milliseconds. And it's not. It's 62. But you need to consider which amount of data I have received in this amount of time, of course. I receive 100 value changes for each of the 5000 nodes within an average distance of those changes of 65 milliseconds. And I requested 50. So here you can see uh, the difference. And it's not going to be faster than that because that's a revised uh, publish interval of the server. The only thing I can do now is to increase the number of nodes to find the dripping point where the server is not able to deliver this amount of data within the 50 milliseconds anymore. But that's a different test. So this is about polling data with a read in a loop and to use the publish uh, and the subscription mechanism um, that we have in the, in the data change client server communication. So as an overview uh, summary here, the first thing to mention is OPC UA is fast and it has the ability to read ad hoc where you need to consider the max age because you may put load on the server. And you can read in a loop which we call polling and then you need to register when reading in the loop to get the best out of the performance. And of course, and even better, you use the notification mechanism for data and for events because that's preserving the server from being overloaded because he can 
uh, consider the scan rate and the publish rate himself. So that's about what, one, what I want to tell you. Thank you very much for listening. Hey everybody, it's Alexander again. And this time I want to talk about another great feature of OPC UA, which allows you to optimize your communication flow. So something that allows you to really reduce the number of data being sent from the server to the client in this example. And this is a feature that we call that bands. So let's look into it. Imagine um, a water level sensor, for example, at the Hoover Dam, we do have four different towers. Each one of them has a water level sensor. And now you can imagine that whenever you do a sample of those sensors, you will never get the same value as the previous one because the water level always changes because of wind, boats on the water, movements, all the different things that are going on will always change the water level. So you actually have more sensitive sensors that you would need for this application. But on the same side, you probably have bandwidth limits or you have costs for every transmitted um, yeah, data package. And because of that, you want to get rid of all the noise and all the different data change notifications which are being sent. So if you look on the left bottom side, you see a graphic which actually shows all the different samples that we have, all the noise on the signal for um, those four different towers. Now, luckily with that bands, OPC UA provides you a mechanism to reduce this. So you can set up one of the two different types that we have, and I'm going to talk about them just in a minute. But this allows you to reduce the number of data change notifications being sent from the server to the client um, because of changed values to the minimum that you actually need. So if you now look at, at the graphic, you see that from having 100 data samples which were transmitted in the previous example for every tower, so 400 in total, we now only have 11 per tower, which makes 44 instead of 400. So this is a tremendous decrease. The beauty of that is that this is being configured on the client side. So the client application chooses the dead band that is of interest for its application. So a dashboard or a condition monitoring system could have a different dead band setup then the operator panel, which probably needs more accurate or yeah, more information. So as I already said, what we have are two different deadband types. And I want to start with the one which is widely adopted, which is the absolute deadband. And the absolute deadband basically allows you to put a deadband around a value with an absolute number. So in this example here, the number is 1.0. So we are only looking for um, yeah, total number changes or more than total number changes. And this feature is part of the standard data change subscription 2017 server facet, which is implemented by all the major automation vendors in their PLCs. So this is something that all your OPC UA enabled devices are most probably supporting out of the shelf. So you just would need to configure it. And this is the beauty here because it works with every numeric data type. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about floating point numbers or integers. Um, it is configured by the client applications. You, know, you can do that afterwards, after you already have your whole architecture and system in place. Now, another beauty, of course, is um, the exact calculation on when to change, uh, when to send a data change notification is part of the specification. And because of that, you can just utilize it. And it's always the same. It's always standardized. Now, the second mechanism that we have um, is the percent dead band. And percent dead band now has a bit more to it. What you can imagine or what you know is that when you do percentage calculations, you always need a baseline. And the baseline is provided in OPC UA by utilizing a type or a subtype of the analog items. 
um, which has the EU range as property. And the EU range tells the applications the normal range where the values are um, in between. So in our example down here, we have an EU range low from 175 and an EU range high of 186. And if you now do the calculation in this example of 10%, you will get that um, you get a dead band of 1.1 in as a total. So you could basically exchange them vice versa if you do the math by yourself. But those percentage changes, of course, are also um, very interesting for different applications, and that is why this is also available. And this is now part of the data access server facet, which is also supported by most of the major automation vendors in their PLCs, as well as in different sensors. So you can basically make use of that off the shelf as well. And that is the beauty with, with this whole mechanism. Now, brief summary, dead bands. Dead bands are there to optimize your communication. So in our example, we reduce the number of data change notifications being sent from the server application to the client because of a value change to the minimum that we actually need. You could also utilize that bands to reduce the noise on signals. So if you say, well, I don't want to have all those noises, uh, all the noise going on there, then you could utilize the dead band um, doing it exactly the same way as to optimize your communication. Big beauty, as I already pointed out, it is controlled by the client application. So this has the advantage that different client applications can have different dead bands, but also it has the big advantage that you can now apply dead bands um, without changing your PLC logic. So you don't need to reprogram anything in your running environment, except for you need to apply changes in the configuration on your client applications. So you would need to update your dashboard configuration, your HMI configuration, but then you can already utilize it without changing anything in the lower controlled network. And that is something that is a big advantage. And we do have two different types of dead bands, where one is the absolute and the other one is the percent dead band. Yeah, I really hope that this helps you um, getting a step further with your OPC UA applications and that you can find mechanisms to make use of that. And I hope you enjoyed um, the session. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is uh, Jaun Jaro from Process, and in this uh, day presentation I will uh, talk about data consistency with uh, OPC UA. I'm concentrating on the client-server uh, communication, where we have a few different options how the clients and servers can exchange data with each other. Uh, the clients are always calling the server, and there are a few uh, service calls that they can use to request data from the from the server. The first one of them is read, which is very useful, for example, for, for parameter reads. The other option for monitoring uh, changes in the server, data changes and events, is, uh, is to create subscriptions and monitor items. And then the clients can use history read to read uh, data that is recorded in the server. Clients can uh, also update data in the server using write calls, especially for parameter updates, but, uh, but it could be kind of anything. Uh, but there are also the other options uh, to call methods, which are more useful when there is an action to be taken in the server, and then the server can also like acknowledge if this action uh, Worked all right. Now, if we look at the connection management, uh, so the topic that I'm concentrating here is how do we ensure that uh, that these data changes are always happening uh, properly, despite of uh, 
interruptions in the in the communications, for example. And if we look at the uh, connection management, uh, the client server communication is based on creating a session between the client and the server. And this includes authenticating the client application in the server. And then all the data exchange occurs over this authenticated session. The session has a timeout, so if the client disappears for some reason, the server can uh, get rid of the resources reserved for this client. Over this session, the client can create subscriptions for these data changes and event notifications, and this enables buffering on the server, even in case of disruptions in the, in the communications. So let's look at the, like a basic example of, of sampling data in the, in the server. Uh, the server starts sampling uh, according to the instructions of the clients, meaning uh, the client creates monitored items, and these define uh, which uh, variables it wants uh, to be sampled on the server or which events it wants to monitor. And the server uh, uses buffers uh, to keep these samples in the server until it has managed to send them to the client. So in this example, uh, the server gets one sample uh, for the data that is being monitored and then delivers this over a data change to the client application. Now, what happens if the connection breaks? All the service calls from the client will fail and the subscription buffers start getting filled. So we get a new sample, but this doesn't manage to get sent to the client. We get another sample that doesn't manage to get sent to the client. But then eventually uh, the connection is recovered and the buffers can be preempted to the client. And then we can continue uh, the sampling and, and delivering the data changes the client like, like in a normal situation should always happen. Now the problem here is that, uh, that we have this server-side buffering, but uh, the buffers are limited. So it's likely that uh, if the connection break is very long, some data will be dropped out. This may be crucial to your application or it may be not. It may be enough for the client to be up to date with the current state of the server, but if you really uh, require all the data changes to be delivered to the client, this may not be all right. The event notifications are also another issue, and uh, and there we have like a more or less defined that the the buffering is unlimited, but of course we all know that there are always limits in these computer systems for memory reasons and so on. But anyways, in this case, uh, the connection breaks again, and then the buffers start getting filled and they can't be delivered to the client. And eventually uh, when the buffer is full and we get the new sample that will be dropped out. And the worst case that can happen is that the subscription times out. It also has a timeout. So after that period without a connection, everything will be dropped from the server. It will clean all the resources because now it thinks that the client will no longer be there anymore. These buffers are all per client and the client defines the length of, of the sampling buffering. But there are actually uh, some buffers in the in the server side as well, and this is uh, like a bit tricky to get uh, get really uh, reliable. So, what other options do we have? Well, luckily we have the history read that could also be used for for buffering data uh, data changes and events. So these are server-side buffers in practice. Whenever we get new samples, they will be delivered 
to clients, but the server still keeps uh, the samples in its own, own buffers if other clients need them. And if we get a connection break, and new samples, they just keep uh, fitting to the buffers. And the good thing here is that the buffer buffers are typically much longer and can be can be much longer than than in the uh, subscription model where the server has to keep separate buffers for each client. And now when the uh, connection is reestablished, the next history read will succeed again. And those new samples will be sent to the client, but the uh, server will still keep the samples also in its own buffer, the history, and they will be available for the other clients to to be uh, read out. So these are uh, indeed shared by all clients, so it and enables long buffering. And you could say, in that sense, it's independent of longer timeouts. It's more or less uh, dependent on the length of the buffering reserved for the server, and that defines uh, defines the uh, capabilities. If we consider uh, service calls in relation to the communication breaks, this is especially important for the write and method calls that the client would use to update data in the server. If the connection break happens, these of course uh, will fail to succeed and we need to wait until the connection is recovered and after that the service calls will succeed again so uh the client just needs to keep retrying until uh, the data is delivered to the server so as a summary opc ui provides a really uh, robust connection management and uh, the subscriptions in there enable server-side buffering, but uh, seamless, and they enable seamless reco uh, recovering from short-term connection breaks. But uh, for long-term connection breaks, we need history read practice. Right, the method calls require retry after connection breaks, and that's more or less the responsibility just of the client application. So with this uh, short presentation, I hope that uh, you get an idea of uh, how OPC UA enables you to keep uh, data consistent between uh, different systems in, in your production. And uh, hope to see you again in the next presentations. With this, the day five has been done. I like to thank everybody on the full week, starting with all the speakers on day one keynotes, day two technology, OPCA, day three collaboration and partners, day four application reports, application hints and international success stories, and day five Q&A with toolkit vendors. This was a huge, tremendous week. It was fun. We had energy. I love the passion of the speakers. Personal thanks from my side for all the support we got, for all the feedback we got. I sent already my thank you here to the team from Film Factor locally here. Um, all the recordings will be made public and available. Just give us a few days. That has been the OPC days for 2022. Please send us recommendations what we can do better what you love to see on new topics. Maybe you have application stories which you like to share or even present on one of the next OPC days or conferences. Overall, stay in contact, stay healthy, all the best. Bye bye, good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are in the world. <laughs>